I am going to read A Tragedy Revealed, A Heroine's Last Days by Ernst Schnabel. As I read it aloud, you could look at the PDF and read along. Last year in Amsterdam, I found an old reel of movie film on which Anne Frank appears. She is seen only for 10 seconds, and it is an accident that she is there at all. The film was taken for a wedding in 1941 the year before Anne Frank and seven others went into hiding in their secret annex. It has a flickering Chaplin-esque. Chaplin-esque means uh, it's referring to Charlie Chaplin and it's an old silent movie. It has a flickering Chaplin-esque quality with people popping suddenly in and out of doorways, the nervous smiles and hurried waves of the departing bride and groom. Then, for just a moment, the camera seems uncertain where to look. It darts up to the right, then to the left, then whisks up a wall, and into view comes a window crowded with people waving after the departing automobiles. The camera swings far to the left, to another window. There, a girl stands alone, looking out into space. It is Anne Frank. Just as the camera is about to pass on, the child moves her head a trifle. That means a little bit. Her face flits more into focus. Her hair shimmers in the sun. At this moment, she discovers the camera, discovers the photographer, discovers us watching 17 years later, and laughs at all of us. Laughs with sudden merriment and surprise and embarrassment at the, all at the same time. I asked the projectionist to stop the film for a moment so that we could stand up to examine her face more closely. The smile stood still just above our heads. But when I walked forward close to the screen, the smile ceased to be a smile. The face ceased to be a face for the canvas screen was granular, granular, and the beam of light spilt into a multitude of tiny shadows as if it had been scattered on a sandy plain. Anne Frank, of course, is gone too, but her spirit has remained to stir the conscience of the world. Her remarkable diary has been read in almost every language. I have seen a letter from a teenaged girl in Japan who says she thinks of Anne's secret annex as her second home, and the play, based on the diary, has seen a great success wherever it is produced. German audiences who invariably greet the final curtain of the diary of Anne Frank in stricken silence have jammed the theaters in what seems almost a national act of penance. Last year, I set out to follow the fading trail of this girl who has become a legend. The trail led me from Holland to Poland and back to Germany, where I visited the moss-grown site of the old Bergen-Belsen concentration camp at the village of Belsen and saw the common graves shared by Anne Frank and 30,000 others. I interviewed 42 people who knew Anne or who survived the ordeal that killed her. Some had known her intimately in those last tragic months. In the recollections of others, she appears only for a moment, but even these fragments fulfill a promise. They make explicit a truth implied in the diary. As we somehow knew she must be, Anne Frank, even in the most frightful extremity, was indomitable. The known story contained in the diary is a simple one of human relationships, of the poignant maturing of a perspective of a perceptive girl who is 13 when her diary begins and only 15 when it ends. It is a story without violence, though its background is the most dreadful act of violence in the history of man, Hitler's annihilation of six million European Jews. Annihilation means complete destruction. In the summer of 1942, Anne Frank, her father, her mother, her older sister Margot, and four others were forced into hiding during the Nazi occupation of Holland. The refuge was a tiny apartment they called the secret annex in the back of an Amsterdam office building. For 25 months, the Franks, the Van Dan family, and later a dentist, 
Albert Dussel, lived in the street in the secret annex, protected from the Gestapo, only by a swinging bookcase which masked the entrance to their hiding place, and by the heroism of a few Christians who knew who knew they were there. Anne Frank's diary recounts the daily pressures of their cramped existence, the hushed silences when strangers were in the building, the diminishing food supply, the fear of fire from the incessant allied air raids, the hopes for an early invasion, above all the dread of capture by the pitiless men who were hunting Jews from house to house and sending them to concentration camps. Anne's diary also describes with sharp insight the youthful humor, the bickerings, the wounded pride, the tearful reconciliations of the eight human beings in the secret annex. It tells of Anne's wishes for the understanding of her adored father, of her despair at the gulf between her mother and herself, of her tremulous, tremulous and growing love for young Peter Van Dan. The actual diary ends with an entry for August 1st, 1944, in which Anne Frank, addressing her imaginary friend, Kitty, talks of her impatience with her own unpredictable personality. The stage version goes further. It attempts to reconstruct something of the events of August 4th, 1944, the day the secret annex was violated and its occupants finally taken into captivity from which only one returned. What really happened on August, on that August day 14 years ago, was far less dramatic than what is now depicted on stage. The automobiles did not approach with howling si sirens, did not stop with screaming brakes in front of the house on Prinnenskrat Canal in Amsterdam. No rifle butt pounded against the door until it reverberated, as it now does in the theater every night somewhere in the world. The truth was, at first, that no one heard a sound. It was mid-morning on a bright summer day. In the hidden apartment behind the secret bookcase, there was a scene of relaxed dom domestic dom domesticity. Domesticity. The Franks, the Van Dans, and Dussel, and Mr. Dussel had finished a poor breakfast of Erzatz, coffee and bread. Mrs. Frank and Mrs. Van Dan, Margot Frank and Mr. Dussel were resting or reading. Anne Frank was very likely at work on one of her short stories. She often wrote when she was not busy with her diary or her novel. In Peter Van Dan's tiny attic room, Otto Frank was chiding the 18-year-old boy for an error in his English les lesson. Why, Peter, Mr. Frank was saying, you know that double is spelled with only one B. In the main part of the building, four other people, two men and two women, were working at their regular jobs. For more than two years, these four had risked their lives to protect their friends in the hideout, supplied them with food, and brought them news of a world from which they had disappeared. One of the women was Meep, who had just got married a few months earlier. The other was Ellie, a pretty typist of 23. The men were Crawler and Kopash, middle-aged spice merchants who had been business associates of Otto Frank before the occupation. Mr. Crawler was working in one office by himself. Kopash and the two women were in another. I spoke to Meep, Ellie, and Mr. Kopash in Amsterdam. The two women had not been arrested after the raid on the secret annex. Kopash had been released in poor health after a few weeks in prison. And Crawler, who now lives in Canada, had eventually escaped from a forced labor camp. Ellie, now a mother, whose coloring and plump good looks were startling like those of young women painted by the Dutch masters, recalled, I was posting entries in the receipts book when a car drove up in front of the house, but cars often stopped after all. Then the front door opened and someone came up the stairs. I wondered who it could be. 
We often had callers, only this time I could hear that there were several men. Meep, a delicate, intelligent, still young-looking woman, said, the footsteps moved along the corridor. The door, then a door creaked, and a moment later, the connecting door to Mr. Crawler's office opened, and a fat man thrust his head in and said in Dutch, quiet, stay in your seats. I started, and at first did not know what was happening, but then, suddenly, I knew. Mr. Koposh is now in very poor health, a gaunt, white-haired man in his 60s. He added, I suppose I did not hear them because of the rumbling of the spice mills in the warehouse. The fat man's head was the first thing I knew. He came in and planted himself in front of us. You three, stay here, understand? He barked. So we stayed in the office and listened as someone else went upstairs and doors rattled. And then there were footsteps everywhere. They searched the whole building. Mr. Crawler wrote me this account from Toronto. A uniformed staff sergeant of the occupation police and three men in civilian clothes entered my office. They wanted to see the storerooms in the front part of the building. All will be well, I thought, if they don't want to see anything else. But after the sergeant had looked at everything, he went out into the corridor, ordering me again to come along. At the end of the corridor, they drew the revolvers all at once, and the sergeant ordered me to push aside the bookcase and open the door behind it. I said, but there's only a bookcase there. At that, he turned nasty, for he knew everything. He took hold of the bookcase and pulled. It yielded, and the secret door was exposed. Perhaps the hooks had not been properly fastened. They opened the door, and I had to precede them up the steps. The policemen followed me. I could feel their pistols in my back. I was the first to enter the Frank's room. Mrs. Frank was standing at a table. I made a great effort and managed to say, the Gestapo.